that. Okay, we are, are we back? Are we on? I hope so. <laughs> okay. um, we had some technical issues. So we have switched computers, and I think we're working now. Uh, we can take your questions. Um, I won't go through all the introductions again. I'm Jamie. This is Deneen. This is Madeline, um, three registered dietitians that are here to help uh, address the questions. Um, and I was beginning to make some comments from just some of the discussions from last week. And uh, thank you for all your involvement in the discussion forum. There is so much going on in there. Um, Lots of contributions, lots of questions, lots of opinions uh, and perspective, uh, testimonials, um, and a lot to be learned just from reading the different perspective. It's also really interesting to look at where everybody's from in the course, uh, pretty much across the globe, um, clustered in the U.S. on the West and East Coast, and then clustered also in Europe, but see distributions in virtually every continent, which is amazing, wonderful, and humbling as well, and a bit scary. Um, and when I first started working on this course, um, you know, didn't really know what I was stepping into, uh, but have tried to integrate some international perspective, but it, it's, you know, it's been tough because, you know, it's definitely my context is the U.S., and I've taught courses here in the U.S., uh, and used a lot of, uh, of course, U.S policies, um, regulations, things like our own food label. In the food labeling session this week, we are using the U.S. food label kind of as the, the foundation to talk about some of the components in a food label and some of the aspects. Um, but it's so interesting to look on the discussion forum under the food labels from other countries um, that we've had like 48 contributions. Um, and just as I scroll down through all those labels, just the, the variety in how information is presented, the variety in how much information is presented um, is really quite interesting. And some countries, of course, have you know a standardized label. Others don't, that you're going to see it presented differently on different food products. Um, so you know that's been quite interesting. Katie, do we have any questions yet? No, um, not yet. Not yet. OK. Um, I was talking earlier about some of the things about healthy diet, uh, and then I can ask my folks here that have attended in person uh, if they have questions. But when we were talking a little while ago about healthy diet, and please chime in so that I'm not just monopolizing everything. Um, but you know, one of the primary considerations for the healthy diet is whether you're meeting needs, um, basic nutrient needs, vitamin and mineral needs. Um, and whether you're meeting recommended levels, and those recommended levels are, you know, to help prevent dietary deficiencies, but also to optimize your health. And in doing your analysis in the first week, you know, one thing you were able to see is how your intake compared to recommended levels. Uh, and, you know, hopefully in doing so, you just saw some ways maybe you could adjust food intake, um, boost intake of I was talking earlier about some of the intake of others. Um, to you know, just improve your overall nutrition. But some other considerations about a healthy diet is how that diet impacts you um, in terms of your cholesterol level, in terms of your blood pressure, in terms of your body composition, in terms of your body weight, and that people do do differently with different, quote, plans. And you know, one message I hope you took away from week one is that there's not a cookie cutter approach to a healthy diet. There's not just one healthy diet, that there's many ways a diet can be healthy. And you saw that hopefully through Peter Menzel's videos when you looked at different intake around the world. Um, I think we can all agree that the more whole foods we include and the less processed foods, probably the better we are. But, you know, reality is convenience is a big factor. So did y'all have any comments? Um, I diet agree with you that there's so many different factors in a healthy diet. And, um, like, I'm a vegetarian, but you know, my mother is not, and she's very healthy, so it's just based on someone's preference. It's many forms of a healthy diet. Yeah. And it is very different all over the world. I lived overseas for a while and saw how people in different countries can eat their cultural food, and it's just as healthy as ours. Yes. Yes. It's important to see all the best. I, I posted a position paper. Um, trying to remember under which thread, but it was um, the total diet approach from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, just saying that, you know, we should look at our diet overall, 
uh, as a total diet, meaning that not to get too overly focused on individual food items, individual even food groups, and that just, you know, it's all within context, which is one what reason I had to do three days of intake records instead of one, because three days is at least a little bit more representative of how we actually eat than just one day, because, you know, there's so much variability in what we choose day to day and how that might play out, and, you know, you don't always have to meet every single nutrient need every day, um, that it's really looking at it overall. Um, one thing that I um, wanted to mention, too, that in week five, yes, week five on plant-based diets, one of the segments will be uh, on the populations around the world that live the longest and what are the common characteristics, and among those common characteristics, what are some of the dietary characteristics of these populations that not only live to 100 and beyond, but live so in, with a high quality of life. And I think that's very indication, a strong indication of what is a healthy diet, um, is what are these folks doing that are living healthfully, that are living, you know, um, longer time in terms of, of decades beyond a lot of other countries. A lot of fruits and vegetables in those diets, um, you know, a variety of protein sources, but pretty much a plant-based diet, uh, moderate alcohols included, physical activities included, and a really strong social um, support system, a lot of family involvement, you know, a lot of um, nurturing going on in their lives and connection with other people. Any questions so far, Katie? No, yeah, no questions. questions. We probably lost a lot of folks in those first minutes, um, so I apologize. We'll, we'll add another virtual meetup next week to kind of make up for um, today's. Um, but uh, do I have any questions from some of the folks? We have several folks that have joined us that are in the class that are from the Nashville area. Yes, sir. What's the recommended servings per day of fruits and vegetables? The recommended servings per day of fruits and vegetables. And, and tell me your, your name. Rick Rodriguez. Rick Rodriguez. Rod, I'm sorry. <laughs> Rick Rodriguez. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't know. I know how to say it. But, um, well, thanks for coming. Rick's from Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and he's joined us today. He's an athlete and interested in nutrition, but was asking about the recommended number of servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, the bare minimum is probably what we hear about five. But when you look at populations that have the healthiest health, or that are the healthiest, they tend to consume 9 to 11 servings per day, which, you know, is far beyond what most of, most of us do. So sometimes you have to think about what's ideal and what's, you know, practical and realistic. But, you know, bottom line, the more the better. Um, and probably optimal is close to 9. Um, to 11. And some populations average 13 servings per day, that most of their intake is coming from vegetables and fruits. That's a, that is a lot. It takes, you know, conscientious effort now, intentionality, to even get in five servings for most people. You have to think about it to be able to get that in. And I, I find in my college students that's one of the biggest things is they don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. But it's not always easy to do so. I try to make it fun, like um, it takes a lot more work, but I'll buy a bunch of fruits at the grocery store and make a salad, or if I wash the grapes and leave them out on the table, we are more apt to walk by and grab a handful. And um, today, I mean, it took um, extra effort, but last month I decided that I wanted to start bringing salads to work. So I had to go buy the, the glass container or whatever Tupperware you would like to be able to carry the salad to work, and it had to be big enough, and then I had to have a smaller one where I could keep my dressings. I didn't want my salad to get soggy, so it takes a lot of effort, but in the end, I put um, a lot of walnuts in it, sun-dried tomatoes, and you can even add strawberries and different cheeses, but it does take a lot more effort, but it's worth it in the end, and you're worth it. Um, one thing I would add is that you are stating fruits and vegetables. I see a lot of weight management patients, and vegetables are great, but so are fruits, and so they'll just go for fruits. And you can't just have nine servings of fruits a day. You need to have the vegetables in there as well. So it is fruits and vegetables. Right, right. Uh, and in some ways, vegetables actually probably have a bit more nutrient density yeah. 
than even the fruits do. Um, and probably when you look at that distribution, it probably should be a little more vegetable heavy than fruit. Um, not to say that fruits aren't you know, a healthful choice and certainly can contribute. Yes? Uh, I do use a lot of vegetables, plant-based diet, but I do it in a smoothie lots of times in the morning. But I understand if you heat some of your kale, I put kale and spinach and some material like that, that I could maybe preheat and then put in my smooth. Would, would that be advantageous or, or not advantageous to, to heat the material before you put it in? So using, um, and it's well, is that right? Tim. Tim, I'm sorry. That's all right. Tim, I'm sorry. Um, Tim um, was asking about using either the fresh version or to, to heat it a little bit before incorporating it into a smoothie. And that's in terms of nutrient content? Yes, yes. Um, not a dramatic difference. You probably could fit more in if you heated it because the, the volume will change. Yeah. Um, you might get a deeper color sometimes too in, in your, your smoothie, so it might change some of the appearance aspects. And some vitamins are actually, um, the heating process actually releases them, particularly your fat soluble, that you have more bioavailability with heating. Um, I wouldn't. I would say there's probably not a huge difference, um, particularly for the volume that you'd be using. What, what, would, what would you say? I agree with you. I've never heard of anybody doing that. It's a, it's a really good question. You know, go for it if you would like to. I'm, I'm not sure for like a half a cup or a cup whether it would be a significant difference. Um, I may be wrong. I mean, that's, that's an excellent question. And you know, making using your fruits and vegetables as a smoothie, what, however we can get them in, you know. And I think if that's a way, and you know, you enjoy it, um, that's great. That's great. You know, probably if more people did that, they might consume them um, in a great way. Because you really do have to kind of think ahead in terms of how you're going to get these in. You have to buy the, the things and pre-prep, and you know, I agree that people like fruit maybe chunked up in a fruit salad with variety a little more than just picking up an orange and having to peel it, although that could be great too. But um, what are some strategies you use to eat more fruits and vegetables? Um, kind of the ones that you said, I mean, I'm mixing the fruits and salads and things, um, adding fruits. I add fruit a lot to my pastas. If I'll have a pasta that's just not fruit and vegetables, I'll roast the vegetables and add them to pastas. Um, I love to grab a handful of fresh spinach and add it to any pasta dish because it's just it just co it cooks it a little bit, just kind of wilts it a little bit, and it's just a great addition and easy way to add a bunch of green vegetables to a dish. And I even use some of the frozen vegetable um, combinations um, and toss those with pasta. Um, there's one that has um, edamame and carrots and black beans and um, just that up, cook your pasta, and you quickly have um, a meal with protein, vegetables, and you know, whole grains too. So. I add beans to a lot of things. I add kidney beans to a lot of salads, chickpeas, and stir fries. Do you think, uh, do you think smoothies over juicing? I mean, smoothies you get more fiber, but you don't get in juicing. Uh, I mean, I've got a son that's very good. Older and is now in on a bit of weight, and I'm trying to figure out how to let me. He doesn't like a lot of vegetables, and so I'm thinking about trying to get him to sort of work on smoothies. You know, to try to get some of that nutrient back. But, you know, trying to decide which would be best, and then smoothies, you know, you get the fault and all that. Right. Um, we're getting the question about um, smoothies versus juicing uh, and some of the nutritional and potentially weight management implications too. I mean, I think part of it is preference um, and you know how what you can juice and what you can incorporate in a smoothie. Just I would I would go more with this. In part because because of the fiber content and because of some of the added bulk, it may be a little more satisfying and, and fill you up more. Where juice um, 
can be great and have nutrition, but you can also easily drink a lot of it. Um, in fact, you know, some of the recommendations for kids is to, to limit the amount of juice we give kids because it goes down so easy and does so little to turn off our appetite. Um, even though it has nutrition in it, that's not minimizing that aspect, but the whole fruit is probably a better choice. Um, but then again, I know you come down to how will people accept it and actually eat it or consume it. But weight management wise, um, um, like Jamie said, we strongly recommend limiting the juice. We see a lot of kids that are just having gallons of juice and that's their main issue with weight management because it's so much easier to just drink lots and lots of that without the fiber that you get in a smoothie. And so even though 100% fruit juice has a lot of those vitamins in it that are great, we really strongly encourage the parents to stick to no more than four ounces a day. Um, I mean, I know it can be a battle, but four ounces is really what we try to stick to. And something like a smoothie, especially if you can get some protein added to that, a smoothie with um, some skim milk or something, or a low fat yogurt, it's a great snack for the kids. That so usually fills them up a lot more than the juice does. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's part of it too, the satiety aspect. Any? I agree. Every once in a while, I, I make smoothies as well, and I add Greek yogurt in my extra protein. So we usually have trouble too with my boys who love milk, and so it's not unusual for them to have you know one or two and sitting you know like two percent milk. Uh, I haven't gotten to to try skim milk, but two percent milk when you're drinking this much, you know, two times that. She's mentioning about, um, and I'm sorry, what was your first name? Um, Kelly. Kelly. Kelly was sharing about her sons mm -hmm. and that drinking large servings of milk, 2% um, milk, um, uh, liquid calories go down easy. Um, and even though, you know, milk can have protein and calcium, you know, don't need too much. Um, and, you know, that was one of the, the most passionate threads on our discussion board was, you know, the need, whether even humans need milk. Um, and I think, you know, we don't. We can certainly meet our needs without any dairy foods or without milk. That's not to say milk's bad or can't be part of a, a very healthful diet, but um, it's not an essential, um, I'm probably getting in trouble with some folks there, um, an essential food that you can meet your protein, your calcium, your riboflavin, um, the, a lot of the nutrients. Vitamin D though, you know, that's one is, issue is that because our milk, particularly in the U.S., is fortified with vitamin D, it's an important source for kids um, for that nutrient. And when you take it out, you know, you do have to think about that consideration. Um, Absolutely. How, how young are your sons? Well, one's about 22. 22 years, very old, right? Instead of the, you know, freshman 15 Sometimes you think being a picky eater would be conducive to weight management, but oftentimes it's not because the foods that are preferred are sometimes more the calorically dense foods and, right. and that, can, that can add up. And, and liquid calories, like you were mentioning, can be a big contributor in weight management. Uh, in fact, like Deneen was saying, a lot of clients, that's one of their major ways they're getting calories in. So if they could go down to 1% or skim, that would help cut calories if they still want to keep their milk. It might be a, a big change at first, but they may get used to it. And maybe that's, you just buy it, and either they drink it or they absolutely. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> and, but, but, you know, there's also some debate now, too, about milk fat. I mean, whether that we're doing ourselves a disservice by switching off to skim and avoiding some of the fuller fat milk. Um, you know, that, that it's, it's just interesting, the science, that I, I think moderation comes back to even yeah. milk products, and, and the personal choice, too, um, you know. and certainly most of the world is actually lactose intolerant, and so aren't consuming milk uh, as we do in the U.S., because you don't have as high rates of lactose intolerance, particularly in the Caucasian population, as you do in, in many other um, groups around the world. Yes, Katie. We have a related question on uh, on our comments. 
And this is from Julie, who is wondering how to control sugar while still getting enough fruits and whole grains. She says it seems really tough. She's tracking her food and exercise, but she still has problems with too many sugars. How do I reduce them and still get enough fruits and whole grains? So, so Julie's great. asking about sugar intake uh, and eating fruits and whole grains. My gut says don't worry about the sugar and fruits and whole grains. Mm -hmm. um, that if you've omitted added sugars, uh, if you've omitted foods that are rich in refined sugars and you know high fructose corn syrup and, and your beverage choices, and that your main source of say sh simple sugars is through fruit um, and you know some of the carbohydrates and grains, which is not necessarily always sugar, um, but more so so a starch or a complex carb. Um, I wouldn't worry about. It. I mean. I agree. Yeah, there were some questions on the discussion board about someone's doctor had told them to watch their sugars, but I believe that doctor was speaking about added sugars and not the natural sugars that you would find in fruit. Basically, just what you was saying. You know, sugar uh, is a certainly a, a quote hot topic, and I think bottom line is we eat too much. You know, um, particularly in the Westernized nations. Um, that a large percentage of our calorie intake is coming from sugar sources, maybe not just all sucrose, but high fructose corn syrup, other sources of sugar that we find in a lot of processed foods, um, and you know that we love sugar. And if you have a choice between a chocolate chip cookie and an apple, um, majority of people, if they were honest, would opt for the chocolate chip cookie. Um, so you know, sugar is so prevalent, so so readily available. Uh, it often competes with the more nutritious foods. So you know, I think there's no question we eat too much and we need to cut down. But whether we have to avoid all sugar, I think is not clear. Um, that if you're active, if you've met your other nutrient nutrient needs, you may have room for some treat through sugar, particularly on occasion. Um, and that to make it a forbidden food. Probably isn't always wise, particularly with kids, because that makes it sometimes even more attractive. Um, so, comments, ladies? So, I definitely think don't make it a forbidden food for kids. I agree with that. I, I, I tell this story in my nutrition class about, um, and I, I won't name any names, but when my older daughter was uh, a Girl Scout, we had coupons for. Um, Cinnabons, which in the U.S. are these ma massive um, cinnamon buns <laughs> with icing and cinnamon and sugar, and they're like huge. Um, probably okay. what six, seven hundred calories each at least. Um, at probably least. they're they're huge. So we had free coupons for these. We were at a mall, and we let the girls get one. Well, most of the girls ate maybe a third or a half of their Cinnabon, and this one young girl whose family practice was no sugar, no anything, you know, her mom packed her lunch every day, which was great, but pretty restrictive diet. This little girl <laughs> not only polished off the entire Cinnabon, but was licking the inside of the container. So, you know, part of the message to me was that she hadn't learned how to deal with those foods, and she's going to be faced with those foods, and how to eat those foods in reasonable amounts, at reasonable times, you know. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's interesting um, what's ideal and what's practical, and you know how we function within a world that has a lot of enticing foods um, can make it tough. We have a um, another question, and um, this is about who regulates the nutrition label in a foreign country. So, does the FDA, so the, the U.S. FDA? Um, help with uh, international guidelines, or do you, could you speak a bit more? Um, Katie was sharing a question about how food labels are regulated in other countries uh, and whether FDA is involved. To my knowledge, FDA is only in the U.S., um, so the Food and Drug Administration is only regulating um, food labels here. Now, it may be that some countries take some guidance from how the FDA is handling things, but not necessarily. I would imagine and this is just um, sort of a guess that most of food labeling is either regulated by a government agency, um, a government health agency in other countries.
countries, or um, that there's not much regulation. Because even in the U.S., we didn't really see our labeling laws go into effect until the 1990s. So it's been you know 20 years um, here, and you know before that, manufacturers could pretty much put on their label what they wanted, how in what format they wanted, and you know now we have a standardized label so people know what to look or where to look for it. And I notice in a lot of the other um, food labels that have been posted internationally that some have much less information, some have as much or more, uh, and some have different formats across different foods. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's kind of an individual country thing and, and hopefully um, some of our students can speak to that uh, from their own countries and their own experience. But thank you. There are always different stamps and yes. new things that they are coming out with that will be placed on labels of foods yeah, or packages. Right. And some of those are the front of package labeling that are coming out from different groups. And here in the U.S., um, there's no standardized front of package labeling. The U.K. Um, does have a standardized front of package labeling um, that um, I think we looked at it in the class in, in terms of um, it used to be kind of a stoplight, and now they've kind of integrated some other aspects into that, too. Uh, and the U.S. is looking at standardizing front of package labeling. Um, right now, it's just the nutrition facts panel that's standardized here. So, you know, I think we're going to see changes around the world as consumers want more information, and they want more information in a format that's useful to them and that's reliable, too. Any other questions so far? Not so far. Not so far. Okay. Any questions from our group? No? The only thing I like to say is the the class that I thought was interesting is that we plan to focus on what we can eat rather than what we can't eat. And I find that so refreshing because all you ever hear is you can't eat this, you shouldn't have that. It would really be nice to know what things we really could and enjoy and feel confident because of the evidence that this is a good choice. Well, Jeannie was mentioning about focusing more on food you can eat instead of food you can't eat. And, you know, I, I think that by doing so, you know, we free ourselves somewhat um, and get away from that negative aspect. And, and um, you know, I, there's even a discussion thread about that. Um, about more focus on what we should include rather than what we don't include. Daniel, can you think of things from the discussion board? Daniel Jimenez is with us. I don't, you can <laughs> pop your head in. Yes, just jump right in there. This is, there's Daniel. Hey guys. <laughs> Daniel uh, is a Vanderbilt undergraduate student in the Medicine, Health, and Society area, and he is monitoring the discussion board. Um, and contributing as well. You've probably seen his name. But have you seen anything that you think would be good for us to comment on today? Well, most of the discussions I've seen that were very popular were comparing the different cooking oils. I yes. know that was a very big, I've seen uh, numerous threads on this issue. So, The cooking oils issue uh, and what is the best cooking oil. Yes. Um, I think somewhat that's individual preference and interpretation. I don't think we know what's the best oil. Um, you know, most people would say olive oil um, because of the high monounsaturated fat content um, and the blend, all fats, all oils are a blend of saturated, unsaturated, and um, or monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. All have different proportions. And I know coconut oil is kind of hot in terms of the application of coconut oil. And I I think, again, we don't know fully with coconut oil. It is a highly saturated oil, and yet there's some research that shows some benefits from using coconut oil. But overall, we probably need to be modest and moderate in our use of, of oils in general um, because they are so calorically dense um, that they can add up really quickly. And, um, so comments, ladies, on oils? or I use, I I use olive oil. I do prefer olive oil. Um, well, I don't fry anything, so um, when I'm sautéing and adding flavor to salad dressings, I prefer olive oil. 
and um, I use a little bit of canola oil as well. I think coconut oil is also becoming very popular because people are putting it in their hair and as lotion, so I think that's also part of the excitement of coconut oil. But I did read in um, the Academy's um, ADA Times saying that it is 91% saturated fat, so it is in moderation. It is a highly saturated fat. So I don't know what, what the implications would be with a broad adoption of coconut oil um, across yeah. the board. So um, Some people are just thinking that they will replace all their oils with coconut oil, and I just think it's good to have a, a varied amount yes, of each yes. oil. And it's fine to have saturated fats within your diet. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a balance of the types of fats um, saturated among them. But, you know, research does show that you see better improvements in blood lipid levels like cholesterol and triglyceride and HDL, LDL um, with a saturated fat intake of 10% of calories or less, even less than 7% in some cases. So, you know, just as long as it's used in conjunction with other types of fats, I think. Have I seen any, I haven't personally read any much science about it. I, do, I prefer olive oil and I'd just be concerned knowing that or seeing it in the um, grocery stores how coconut oil is often solid or yes. Yes. That yes. Just the, the saturated aspect. Yeah. I had a friend who was eat, eating a tablespoon of uh, melted coconut oil every day in taking an anti cholesterol drug. And I said, ah, uh, I don't think that's works. <laughs> Because she was commenting that someone was melting coconut oil yeah. and taking in a, a, a tablespoon table of it. For the health benefits, but also is taking a uh, statin for her cholesterol. But also and taking, like, uh, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I think we still got a lot to learn about so many things. I mean, when you look, when you think back um, 50 years ago or more, that you know, moms sometimes would line their kids up and give them a tablespoon of cod liver oil every day. Well, there was, you know, come. It's, that was probably wise. I mean, rich in omega-3 fatty acids, some essential fatty acids, that it probably wasn't a bad idea. But, you know, for several decades, people scoffed at that that was practiced, you know. But now it's like, no, oh, it probably wasn't, probably pretty good for those kids to be taking the cod liver oil. So we have lots to learn. One thing that, about olive oil um, that a chef had shared with me was that for flavorings, like with salad dressings, um, when you're using, say, to, to dip your bread, or different uses for olive oil, the, the virgin olive oil or the extra virgin olive oil is it's a lighter flavor and, and probably preferable. But for sautéing uh, or heating, that just regular olive oil, not the extra virgin, probably works better because of some of the smoke points and some of the differences in the two types of oil. And so now I have both bottles. Um, and, you know, whether, I don't know how much was behind that, but certainly um, I, I did it after the chef told me. I'll ask my mom. mom. She's yes. in culinary school. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between using. So some of you might know a little bit about the difference in the applications of, um, say, different virgin or extra virgin or regular olive oil. I find it's hard to find regular olive oil anymore. Yeah, sure. It's actually almost all extra virgin or virgin. We have, a few, we have a lot of questions. Oh, people more have questions. found us, so that's <laughs> wonderful. Hi. I'm sorry about the tech difficulties earlier. This is Denise. This is Madeline. So we have um, had a few questions uh, about using food to help avoid or delay congenital diseases or as a way to substitute or supplement conventional health care around chronic diseases. So do you, um, so if you could speak to that question about how to use food to treat diseases. Interesting. How do you use food to avoid, avoid components to, to prevent diseases? Um, gosh, uh, I think that could be a, quite a discussion. Um, one thought that comes into my mind is this newer area of nutrition called nutrigenomics that's looking at our genetics and potentially um, how food choice, how our dietary patterns may play out in our lives based on our own personal DNA, our um, genetics in terms of disease risk, in terms of um, just overall health. 
and you know that's a very new area and I don't think at this point we really are at a place where we can make individualized um, recommendations based on that but when you mention some of this some of the things that pop into my mind is actually uh, in week four we're going to be talking about functional foods which are foods that have um, beyond their nutritional value seem to have attributes um, primarily in disease prevention, um, heart disease prevention, um, cancer prevention. Um, for example, omega-3 um, salmon is considered a functional food. Not only you know, is it a great protein source, healthy fats, other nutrients, but it also, um, the, omega, the high omega-3 um, aspect of salmon makes it functional in that that plays a role in heart disease reduction. Um, you know, blueberries um, have functional attributes above and beyond being a healthy fruit um, that they play out in terms of potentially some, you know, cognitive or brain health, um, cancer prevention. So, you know, um, yes, and I think that's the functional food market is a really interesting market and we'll, we'll look at functional foods and, you know, I even have an interview with a vice president from Smart Balance who make um, spreads that are I love smart balance. Yeah, I, I love them. I actually consulted for them for quite a few years, and it was interesting just to kind of see behind the scenes of functional foods because um, their spreads, some of their products are fortified with additional omega threes. They're fortified with vitamin D in many cases. And part of my questions to um, Dave McCarty with Smart Balance was about why do you choose to add these nutrients, do you think they have public health implications in terms of helping prevent disease? And I, I think one reason goes back to the fact that, you know, it's hard to get everything in um, and that sometimes functional foods can play a role in helping us meet our needs and potentially prevent disease uh, of some type. So ladies, any comments, my fellow dietitians here? First thing that came to my mind, well, you know, there are certain diseases that are treated with food, such as yes. celiac disease, with a gluten allergy. So, isn't the only treatment a gluten-free diet, pretty much? Then there are certain diseases where you can improve symptoms um, with food, you know, decrease symptoms, such as heart failure, of course, where I work primarily is encouraging people to follow a fluid restriction when they have a lot of swelling and as well as a low sodium diet. So foods can play so many roles in different diseases, preventing it when it's already progressed. I work with um, a population that often has um, elevated liver enzymes and so they're, work they're headed in the direction of unfortunately liver failure. But then working with a dietitian and working with weight loss, it shows the blood values of their liver enzymes go down if they choose a proper diet and lose weight. And so that is another example of how, you know, eating healthy can then in the long run prevent a disease. Mm -hmm. But it is possible, I'm certain. Yes. And, and you know, the, um, but again, I think we have so much to learn in this area. And I do think people have to be cautious about simply relying on dietary modifications um, and sort of rejecting sometimes traditional medical care in favor of what we think of as more holistic interventions. I mean, certainly that there's some validity and value in you know, healthy diets and more holistic approach, um, but um, not to necessarily reject the many things we've learned and the many values that um, are available through sometimes the medications. I mean, like statins, for example, which are cholesterol-lowering meds, the research is pretty dramatic in terms of improving, you know, extending life, extending years for people. Uh, I mean, some people have joked that we need to put statins in our drinking water. Um, but, you know, some value there. And you can't get some of that cholesterol lowering, some of those lipid changes with diet alone. Um, that you have to have that boost with, um, you know, some of the, the things we've learned with some of these. And I think that speaks um, to another question. Uh, someone asks, why is trans fat dangerous? Will they be burned through activity also? Oh, good question. Y'all want to take trans fats? or Well, trans fat is 
extra harmful because it raises your bad cholesterol, um, some of the more harmful LDL cholesterol, but in addition to lowering your good cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol. So unlike saturated fats, which only touch the harmful cholesterol levels, the trans fat is also decreasing your, your good cholesterol. So that's why it's, it's a, a big evil and why people are, are paying attention to it nowadays. They started adding it to foods to increase the shelf life and not knowing that it was that harmful. So that's why now they are labeled a nutrition label. Are they mandated to label trans yes, fats? Yes, trans fats are now mandated. I think of 2006 um, that food companies have to include the amount of fat, trans fats on a, a label in the U.S. Yeah. Aren't they completely human manufactured? No. There, there are some trans fats naturally in foods, but it's very minimal, very minimal. Trans fats are made through the hydrogenation process. When liquid fats are made more solid through hydrogenation, when um, and oftentimes changing them from a liquid state to a solid state. So therefore, like um, margarines tend to be higher in trans fats than butter. I mean, butter really is trans fat free almost. Um, but margarine, stick margarine, can be very high in trans fats. However, many manufacturers, particularly here, have reformulated their products and that even margarines, tub margarines, and even some stick margarines are either very low or trans fat free. Um, in part because when they had to start declaring on their label trans fat content, Absolutely. some manufacturers stepped back and said, no, we better reformulate because, for example, if two cookies, one had three grams of trans fats in their cookie and one had zero for the same type of cookie, then consumers may opt for the zero. Um, one consideration is that, you know, and I, I'm sorry, I keep saying here in the U.S., here in the U.S., but manufacturers can say zero for trans fat if the product has less than half a gram of trans fat. Um, so it could have 0.4 or 0.49. Uh, and so if you had several servings of that food, you would still be getting some trans fats through that. So there's, there's um, efforts underway to to actually declare exact amounts, not just round it to zero. My mom had, um, she actually asked me this in the grocery store one day, that she was told that this particular brand of bacon bits was healthy, um, because it was soy or something that had no actual bacon in it, and I didn't know it had it, I looked at it, and it said trans fat free, and it also said that one serving was um, one teaspoon. And I pointed out to my mom, the first ingredient label was trans fat. <laughs> hydrolyzed, and um, so I was like, well, Mom, I know how much you're adding to your salads, so you're probably getting <laughs> actually a lot more, <laughs> and so. And you can tell if something has trans fat in the nutrition label if you look at the ingredients, and it says hydrogenated oils, yeah, right. hydrogenated oils. But, you know, along that same vein is that um, Madeline mentions shelf life, and so just completely taking trans fats out of our food supply is not as easy as it might sound, uh, easy as it might sound, that it will, you know, for a cookie or cracker, it's going to dramatically change how long that food will stay safe and quality, that fats, you know, um, hydrogenating, um, fats don't go rancid as fast, even some texture and taste qualities are altered when you manipulate the fats and oils, so, um, that's certainly not in defense of trans fats, but also saying there's there are considerations um, when you look at that. And, you know, really the recommendations are as little as possible on trans fats. Um, so, and you can stay away from trans fats by using much less packaged, convenience, processed foods. Yes. Great. Okay, we have another question um, from David, who is a vegetarian, and he is asking, what are the meals where I can get As a vegetarian, we have a vegetarian. Yes, I'm a vegetarian. I get a lot of my protein from beans and nuts. I'm always eating sesame seeds and walnuts, and um, I really like natural peanut butter as well. Um, I'm what you would call a pescatarian, so I do eat some seafood. So I enjoy some shrimp and sushi dishes, uh, especially tuna. So that's also um, easy for me to get my protein from. 
seafood sources. And sometimes I eat a little bit of soy products um, to also get my protein. I'm trying to think of any other favorite protein sources. So do you include any milk products in your diet? I do. I, I choose organic milk. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing, I kind of um, dipped into the vegan world for a little bit and I was only doing soy and, and no dairy, but I really like my cheese and my dairy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm kind of that way too. I, I, I am not vegetarian, although I eat vegetarian the majority of the time. But I don't. Um, I do have an occasional um, serving of you know, poultry, meat, fish, certainly. I was a um, lacto ovo vegetarian for, gosh, just a eight or nine years. Um, I recently, uh, last year, just began eating chicken again, uh, just personal choices. Um, and I love making like black bean burgers, um, I did eat soy, I didn't, I don't like tofu, so I never ate tofu, but um, I was a big fan of soy milk, and like we mentioned, I don't know if y'all heard, but smoothies with like soy um, milk in them was a great protein source for me, and like Madeline said, all natural peanut butter, I eat lots of peanut butter. Nuts, tofus, beans, beans. Um, and in week five, we actually will be talking about plant-based diets and all the different types of vegetarian diets and some of the nutritional considerations, um, for example, which those nutrition consider, nutritional considerations become greater the, quote, stricter you are. Um, when you move towards the vegan type lifestyle and omit all animal foods, then you do have to look at things like where you're going to get your B12, where you're going to get some of your nutrients, whereas vegetarians that include um, eggs, milk, fish, rarely have um, to worry about some of those things. So um, we will look at some of those issues. And another question here is about uh, sodium intake and low blood pressure. So that speaks again to our yes. issues we talked about earlier. So if you could address how do you do, how do you manage sodium with low blood pressure? So if you already have low blood pressure, my gut says to not follow a low sodium diet. I don't, I don't see why it would be beneficial to follow a low sodium diet. But, you know, I, I agree. Um, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is the recommendations are a population wide recommendation, and that certainly there's going to be individual differences. Um, and, so, you know, personally, I. Madeline and I were talking about this before we started today, that she follows um, about a 2,000 milligram um, low sodium diet, and I don't really count sodium. Um, you know, my blood pressure is, is very, not low, but it's certainly on the low side of normal, and um, that's just not, you know, I feel like the more things you have to worry about <laughs> or think about, the less likely you are to do anything, because then you're like, oh, what do I eat? So. Um, but I don't add salt. I don't do those things. But um, but she was mentioning that you know certainly for some people it, it's not indicated or warranted um, to yeah. go low. The main reason I was I, I am following it, and and I won't be doing it forever. But I teach a lot of the adult population on my floor. They are on low sodium diet, so I kind of for an empathy standpoint to you know when they're telling me it's very hard. I want to be able to let them know that, yes, I have tried it, and um, you can do it, or this is what I found difficult, what about you, or we can have better solutions with each other. That's wonderful. Yeah. Any, any? Um, all right, we have two questions I'll give you together. So the first is, what should I drink instead of Coca-Cola? <laughs> this person is addicted. And then, um, what foods will help reduce stress? Okay. okay. All right. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, in instead of Coca-Cola. All right. My recommendation may not be well received by everybody, but it, it depends on you uh, and the role Coca-Cola is playing in your life. Now, I remember having patients uh, in weight management, and I remember one gentleman who was drinking about three liters to four liters a day of Pepsi. And 
our first step with that um, gentleman was just to switch to Diet Pepsi first. That sometimes it's unrealistic to say, okay, no more Coke, no more Pepsi, start drinking water. Um, that at least in the transition period, and I'm not saying to drink three or four liters of diet either, because you certainly don't want to get that much artificial sweetener in. But you know, if there's a, a, a weight issue that sometimes even you know, using a modest amount of, of a diet beverage um, may be appropriate. Um, I'm not recommending um, diet sodas per se, but I'm saying in a transition period, trying to wean yourself off. Um, and then to use flavored waters um, you know, that have some taste beyond. It was interesting, there was a study in kids at a camp. And the kids went to camp, and what was interesting that was a, a good percentage of them actually were dehydrated when they entered camp. Um, but then they were exercising outside, doing all these things, which could further the risk of dehydration. Uh, and one day they offered just all water, and they monitored how much the kids drank. Another day they offered flavor water, and they monitored how much the kids drank. And the third day they monitored, they gave them um, sports beverages. Well, the intake was like this, that the lowest intake was with just water, then the flavored water more, and the sports beverages even more. Um, and I guess part of that is you have to also think about what appeals to people. And even though water is probably our ideal beverage choice, um, that flavoring water, green tea, um, other beverages, you know, are, are great too. And um, sometimes hydration is your goal too. Um, but I've got a rambling, but any comments there on? I would agree probably starting with a diet just because you, or, or if it's the carbonation that you like, you could try some sparkling waters or club soda. Yeah. I love sparkling water, and sometimes the, the sparkling, the gas in it is a little too much for me, and I, you know, I can mix it with my flat water. Um, I drink a lot of water. I flavor it with um, natural lemon or lime. helps it have a little more flavor as well. And I drink a lot of um, iced teas, um, a lot of, like, decaf herbal ones, because I, I get migraines if I drink too much caffeine. Yeah, but I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's tough, and I, you know, liquid calories can add up. So you do have to. I kind of laugh that the only liquid calories I will consume are red wine and <laughs> <laughs> not a whole lot, um, and occasionally, um, you know, milk. But I, I don't actually drink milk every day um, as a beverage choice. Um, I use a lot of other beverages instead. And then I think our last question here that we have at the moment is, what foods will help reduce stress? Okay. Um, kind of different for everybody. Yeah, it is different for everybody. I, I think, you know, it, red wine. Red, red wine. <laughs> 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 um, <I don't> <laughs> so hot beverages tend to be soothing. Um, and in terms of foods, when you, when you look at um, what, how food affects our brain chemistry, carbohydrates actually are more the soothing nutrient, you know, um, in terms of raising serotonin levels, um, kind of, um, you know, if in the middle of the afternoon you just grab a plain bagel with nothing on it, um, you're probably going to be sleepy in the next hour because um, you're just consuming almost pure carb. Um, if you mitigate that with protein, you're going to dull that effect, but, you know, Carbohydrates are kind of the soothing nutrient um, when you think about brain chemistry. We rarely eat them just solely carbs, but um, just the effect of that. Um, and a lot of the times when we think about lowering our stress, it's some of the foods we think of as comfort foods, foods that we had as children, um, foods that we kind of feel are um, relaxing. And, and again, like Denise said, it, it can be very individual. Um, I know there are some foods that I've seen articles and studies on foods and stress. Um, I can't think of any, but I, um, I find that. I know there's actually been a couple of books written on, on stress and, and food intake. And also, at least for me, I know what causes me stress is not getting things done in the day. 
So if I follow a general healthy diet that I know gives me more energy, then that's in a way stress relieving for me yes. as opposed to yes. eating the junk food, the bad food, the processed food that's going to keep me tired throughout the day and not have the energy to do what I need to do. And you know, and the last thing I want to do in this course, and the last thing I want to do with my college students in my class is cause them more stress by making them worry more about what they're eating or not eating. Right. Um, so you know, um, I, I think trying to find that ha healthy balance of, of foods that we enjoy, um, foods that meet our needs, um, without over obsessing about everything and causing more stress in our life. Um, and like Janine said, you know, just just getting those core needs met um, you know, with a balanced, varied, and adequate diet will go a long way to just helping stress levels and energy levels too. So. And our final question here on the forums is about um, someone recently switched from black tea to green tea. So what about caffeine and green tea? Does green tea have caffeine? <coughs> Yes, um, green tea does have caffeine. It's not a, a huge amount. Um, and, you know, in terms of caffeine, again, um, the research is mixed. Um, it, it appears that a moderate amount of caffeine intake is not an issue for the majority of people. Um, and again, that's, you know, some people are more sensitive to the impact of caffeine than others. Um, but there's actually some studies that correlate like with coffee consumption and reduce risk of diabetes. And, um, and I'm not sure personally the difference between black tea and green tea in terms of the caffeine content. White tea has the least amount, and I believe black tea has the most. And I think green tea is in the middle. And I've read that uh, it's still not a whole lot. Yes. And it's still, yeah, very small amount. And all the teas are the same. Yes. And there are um, decaffeinated versions of green teas and all teas available if, if that's a concern. How are we doing on time, Katie? Well, we're at an hour just about from when we actually started the sound. So. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we'll let you know of a time next week, um, probably next Friday is what we're looking at, um, in part to kind of make up for it today. And I've, Forgive me to those that tuned in earlier and we didn't quite have our sound and tech aspect working. We'll blame it on my computer. My personal laptop was, I think, the issue. Um, but thanks again and see you in the discussion board. Thank you, ladies. Thanks, Bye. Madeline. Thanks, Nadine.